Welcome back to the second day of the FWS WOSA Virtual Reunion 2021. We hope you enjoyed yesterday's session and are ready for more. Once again, we ask you to imagine that we're together in Parker Hall, a place that brings back many memories for all of us. What do you remember most of all? Was it a play or a concert that you were a part of? Or an assembly where something unexpected happened? Or maybe it was just the uncomfortable chairs. I'm sure that many of you will remember the green room backstage. This is where many of us suffered stage fright, waiting for the curtains to open. Today's reunion session includes lots of exciting presentations and performances by alumni, many of whom waited in this very room years ago before they stepped onto the stage. To start our program today, let's welcome Dr. Craig Cook, Woodstock's principal, who will say a few words to our alumni audience. It's my privilege to welcome you to all to Parker Hall today on this special occasion of WOSA FWS reunion. While I join you virtually, we certainly stand together in spirit in the beauty, history, and memory of this sacred place called Parker Hall. For so many of us, this is where new thoughts were forged, new friendships were strengthened, and maybe new ideas were brought to your mind, even as an audience member. I give thanks every day for our alumni as I think about all that you've contributed to the Woodstock community, both while here as a student and beyond in the world. Your dynamic engagement with the school on so many levels is one of the key contributors to making Woodstock such a healthy place. Our partnership with alumni is the linchpin, actually, which makes the spirit of Woodstock alive in the world. I'd just like to say a hearty thank you to each one of you for your ongoing efforts with us as you engage with us on so many levels. You all, as alumni, truly imbibe the spirit of Woodstock, which says that we can do anything we set our minds to. We can overcome all kinds of obstacles, and yet we can also come up with solutions for the common good and which serve greater humanity. So thank you for that. In the near future, we have plans to renovate Parker Hall, keeping its character and identity in place, even as we update its physical contours. We, of course, will be looking to you as our partners in this. So be on the lookout for more details coming in the following months. Again, let me just say thank you to each of you for your continuing engagement with the Woodstock School community, and we will continue to situate Woodstock for effective service in the 21st century, but we can't do it without you. So thank you for your assistance and help as we move the school forward. Wishing you all the best until we meet face to face yet again in the near future. Thank you. Our first presentation is a series of vintage films from the 1930s and 40s taken by John Friesen, class of 1933. These will be introduced by his son, Weldon Friesen, class of 1959. The accompanying music is by former staff member Pete Wildman. Hello, I am Weldon Friesen of the class of 1959. The 8mm uh, camera and home movies were the latest technology in the 1930s when my father, John Friesen, returned to India as a second generation missionary. John was of the class of 1933. However, in 1931, he returned to the United States with his parents to complete high school and college. And following his marriage in 1939, he returned to the land of his birth, to India, to spend the next 42 years. Home movies were a great form of family entertainment. However, they also served as a supplement to the narrative of stories of a 
exotic culture in a strange land for family back home in the U.S., as well as uh, for supporters of Mennonite missions. I know you will enjoy these brief clips of Landauer and of Woodstock School, and also of train travel with the school party taken in the late 1940s and early 50s.
far away I still hear their voices calling in the night And my skies are still filled with that mysterious light Never forget, you carry the ghosts inside. For my eyes still see the glory of your sunrise. And my ears still hear the whisper of the pine. Lying in the darkness Feel that I could just Reach out my hand And touch the child Whose heart belongs to those times Night and day But sleeping, waiting for a call I close my eyes I can walk among them Revisiting them all Love and hate, regret and pride forget though I often tried for my eyes still see the glory of your sunrise and my ears still hear the whisper of the pine Lying in the darkness, I feel that I could just reach out my hand and touch the child whose heart belongs to those times. And touch the child. Whose heart belongs to those times Greetings from Atlanta, Georgia. I'm Joyce Burkhalter Flickiger, class of 1970, and a professor of South Asian religions at Emory University. Several years ago, when I visited Missouri, it struck me how little I knew about the shopkeepers, families, and their histories. And I mentioned this to the son of a jeweler I had known growing up, and his answer was so gracious. Aptu Bachiti, you were just a child, now you can learn. Talking with Woodstock alumni, I realized that our knowledge of the bazaar and its residents is both gendered and generational. For example, growing up, boys were much freer than girls to go to the bazaar and on overnight hikes without supervision, and thus they knew the bazaar and the mountains better than we girls did. I returned to Landauer three times between 2018 and 2019 to learn more from where, when, and for what reason shopkeepers' families had come to the 
live in the bazaar and how Missouri has come to be home for them. I lived at the top of Mullingar Hill as a house guest. The home was a wonderful place from which to observe the shifting rhythms of the bazaar determined by time of day, seasons and festivals. I hope to write about some of these rhythms and some of the stories of the shopkeepers' families. However, today I wanna to talk about what it means to return home through some Indian terms and rituals. I found that one effective way to explain who I am and why I am living in India for extended periods of time is Hindustan Maika Amrika Sasaral. That is, Hindustan is my mother's place, Maika, and America is my in-law's place, Sasaral. While the sense of belonging to one's sasaral may shift over a woman's lifespan, the distinction between an affective associations with mica and sasaral are never totally erased. My conversation partners take pleasure in my desire to return to my mica, Hindustan. When I returned to live in the bazaars, shopkeepers remembered my mother, Ramoth Burkhalter, who with my father left India in 1989, and I remembered several of their fathers from my school days. But the most significant connection for most of them was the fact that I had been born in Landauer Community Hospital, where many of them had also been born. They recognized Landauer as my mica and my presence as a return home. I began to look for a Hindi word for home that would be equivalent to a word I knew from Telugu, Uru. I've subsequently learned the Hindi, the Urdu term vatan to be similar, home place whose very water soil and air is say, said to shape the personhood of, per, of the people living there and that of their descendants who may have never lived there, like DNA. A bizarre friend suggested that I use the term mul nevas, literally root house or dwelling, a term found on many bureaucratic forms. The next day I asked four <clears throat> bizarre residents what they would identify as their Mulnavas. And when I received four different answers, I knew the term had some traction. A butcher whose great grandfather first came to Missouri replied Afghanistan. A driver employed by Woodstock said Bihar, although he had never been there. A friend who grew up in Mumbai, but who takes great pride in her Gujarati language and food responded Gujarat. And a Sikh shopkeeper stopped to think because he said, his Mulnavas was a village in Pakistan that was no longer accessible to him. He wasn't sure whether or not this village counted as his root place. I learned of a unique Garwali custom that marks such root places. A smooth stone called a Pitar Patar or Pitar Kulni is carried from the cremation ground back to one's ancestral village, whether or not the family maintains a home or fields there. The stone is placed among larger rocks at the edge of the village or in a retaining wall or push stump at, at one of its fields. I imagine this ritual as one enactment of return home to the womb of the mountain. For the elders I spoke with, Mul Nabas or the Pitar Patar ritual connote a particular kind of home place that shapes who one is. And yet they also belong to Missouri, and Missouri also shapes who they are. This belonging is created in part through ritual and daily interactions in the bazaar. I attended domestic rituals and documented post monsoon festival processions through which different families and communities individually and collectively mark belonging in the bazaar. Each Indian language term for home, Ghar, Gaon, Maika, Sasral, Mulnavas, Vatan, connotes home in a different valence and thus may refer to different places. These categories give us creative ways to think about homes lost and gained. While these mountains are for many Woodstock alumni foundational, our Mul Navas or Vatan, we can and do create other homes and ways of belonging without giving up our root place.
Hello. For those who may not know me, uh, my name is Peter Ludd, and I was a teacher at Woodstock uh, for 10 years. Uh, my first term was 1972 until 1975, and then again 1978 till 1985. I used to teach English literature and drama. Uh, for me, I've been in education now for 48 years, and my days at Woodstock uh, have been amongst the happiest times of my life. However, let me get on to now Parker Hall. For me, I spent a lot of my teaching time in, in Parker Hall as the drama teacher. Uh, but for me, Parker Hall was much more than just a theatre for plays. It was, in fact, the cultural centre, the religious centre, the social centre, the music centre, the commencement centre. In fact, it was the centre of all activities at Woodstock School. And so many wonderful things happened in Parker Hall. There were talent shows, there were Indian music concerts, there were symphony orchestra evenings, there were staff plays, there were Sunday services, there were morning assemblies, everything connected with the life of Woodstock was centred in Parker Hall. I can never forget, and those of you who were at Woodstock during the years of the principalship of W.W. W. Jones will remember in Parker Hall the wonderful stentorian tones of his hymn being belted out, Amen, 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 etc. It also involved drama. And I recall in my first one-act play class in 1978, I had about 40 people sign up. And for me, anybody who signs up for a drama class clearly needs to be given an opportunity to act. And so I directed 12 one-act plays to ensure, uh, to ensure that every single person in, in the class was given a major role to play. Amongst the many productions that I remember producing were Twelfth Night, A Midsummer Night's Dream, A Comedy of Errors, Our Town, um, and The Crucible. It was during a rehearsal of The Crucible, in fact, it was the dress rehearsal. And uh, one of my lead actors was a, a young man called Gurinder Singh Bhatti. He was from Canada and he was affectionately called Gary Batty. However, he kept on forgetting his lines, and so I lost my temper, and I said, Gary, for goodness sake, remember your lines. And he looked at me and said, Hey, Mr. Lug, cool it, man, cool it. <laughs> In fact, I got even angrier. However, uh, he did well on the actual night, so all went well. I also remember, during a comedy of errors, uh, one of the lead actors, Jeet Singh, he fell ill <coughs> the day before the actual uh, production. <clears throat> and so I remember having to step in overnight into that major role. It went off all right, so um, all was well, that ends well. For me, <coughs> it was also a place of worship, a morning assemblies as Sunday evening services. It was a place where everybody got together for talent shows, for staff plays. I remember two staff plays in particular. <clears throat> One was Blythe Spirit and the other was, oh, well, three, HMS Pinafore and the Pirates of Penzance. I must say the students thoroughly enjoyed it. For me also, Parker Hall gave the opportunity of wonderful staff-student 
interactions and relationships. Um, <clears throat> I also witnessed some other wonderful productions produced by Bill Shryock. Uh, for example, Fiddler on the Roof was an outstanding production of his. And another one was um, The Miracle Worker. Uh, wonderful, wonderful uh, plays. And it, it really showcased the talent that is so clearly evident amongst the students of Woodstock. Uh, for me also, it brings back very, very fond memories. I visited the school for a reunion of the class of 1980 uh, in 2016. And as I walked into Parker Hall, it looked exactly the same. It hadn't changed. And rightly so, because it should remain as it is for old timers like me who visit. It brings back a flood of memories and all of them good memories. For me, I had wonderful relationships with all my students. I remember all of them very, very well. And uh, there was a fantastic collegiality amongst the staff. Uh, indeed, Woodstock School was really a, a little world in, it, in itself. It had various nationalities, both on the staff uh, and amongst the students. And it was a place where there, were di there was diversity, and yet there was this tremendous wholeness. And I think that is one of the distinctive features of Woodstock. So for me, I hope Parker Hall will remain the wonderful place it was and is. And I hope it will remain so in the future as the centre of life of a wonderful, wonderful school. Thank you. Hello, I'm Marin Glover, Woodstock student from third grade in 1978 to graduation in 1987 and a student teacher in 1992. I've done a bunch of things since leaving Woodstock from teaching English drama and dance to community-based arts to high school library work, uh, not to mention marriage and motherhood and living in Australia, India, Nepal and Scotland, which is now my home. All along, I have been writing, and in recent years, that has been the focus of my work, including four plays on BBC Radio, short stories, journalism, poetry, and novels. Many of you will be familiar with my first novel, A House Called Askaval, that is set in Missouri and spans India's history since independence. It features an international boarding school that you may find suspiciously familiar, although all the characters are, of course, fictional, except for Gandhi, uh, who really did lead a prayer meeting in Missouri, as described in the book. This is the hardback version, and this is the paperback version, and this is the new edition that has just come out, um, available from wherever you get your books, just ask them to stock it. And here are the opening sentences, uh, which is a scene that will conjure memories for most of us. Chapter one. When Ruth finally returned to Masuri, it was late August, late monsoon, late in the day. Mist was rolling up from the valley like a brooding spirit, seeping into the hollows between hills, crawling over boulders, drowning trees. From her open window on the bus, she felt it slip over her arm, smelling of damp earth and wood smoke and dread. My second novel of Stone and Sky has just been published this May and is set where I live in the highlands of Scotland. This one is the story of a shepherd who disappears and leaves a mysterious trail of his possessions leading up into the Kengal Mountains. His foster sister Mo and prodigal brother Sorley are compelled to discover the forces that drove him away. Their story circles out to embrace the entire community, its history and the landscapes that shaped them. Spanning almost a century, 
The novel is a hymn to the connections between people, their land, and a way of life. According to the publisher, it is a profound mystery, a political manifesto, and a passionate story of love, loss, and redemption, shot through with wisdom and humour. Here are the opening sentences of this one in a chapter titled Eulogy. We are gathered here today on the shore of Loch Hope, in the presence of God, in the worshipful company of birds and beasts, on the hallowed ground of the earth, to give thanks for the life of Colvin Munro. We do not know that he is dead, and without certainty and without a body, we cannot perform last rites or lay him to rest. But we must release him and we must lay ourselves to rest. There is a time to bind and a time to let go. Despite their radically different contexts, there are a few things that these novels have in common. One is that the cover designer for of Stone and Sky also did the latest edition of Ascaval, and I love these covers. Secondly, they both feature mountains. For those of us who know the Himals, the Kengo Mountains are by contrast just small rounded hills, but they are much, much older. And in fact, at one time were probably higher than the Himals, but have been eroded down over millions of years. And finally, for both books, I had a friend who read multiple drafts and gave wise feedback. Former Woodstock teacher and current board member, Kathy Hoffman. What's more, the Woodstock community continues to celebrate my work, just like a proud family. Thank you all. I am indebted to the school for its many and ongoing gifts. Thank you for listening. I'd love to hear from folks. You can always find me on maringlover.com and I'm looking forward to meeting you. Namaste. Hi there. Uh, Stephen Alter asked me to make a small recording for our reunion this year and talk about Indian stamps and my personal story because a unique event happened this year. Well, the first question would be, how on earth did I get into Indian stamps? That's my hobby. And it goes back to third grade at Ridgewood. And I was in boarding school and it was the monsoons and I was a little blue because I had just been put in boarding and my mother was gone. And Mrs. Hempstead, I believe that was her name, kindly took me aside and asked me, didn't I have a hobby for the hobby show? I'd never heard of the hobby show. I didn't know what a hobby was. And she said, well, you need to have a collection. And I said, like what? And she said, why don't you go on the hillside on the cud and get some ferns? And 15 minutes later, I came back all muddy and I had about six different kinds of ferns. And she helped me press them and between newspapers and I mounted them on a couple of pieces of paper and I put them in the hobby show and I got a ribbon. Well, I was set. With that in mind, I have spent in the last 60 years of my life collecting and labeling things. I have a plant collection in my yard with 650 different hosta with labels on them. I have 20 different kinds of oak trees. I can't find Quercus and Kana, but I have 15 other oak trees, including a Central Asian oak, which might have been close to Quercus and Kana of Mr. Fleming fame. But my mother started me on Indian States. Now there is no hobby more boring than Indian State stamps. And I can show you, but I found out from KWI that somebody, that Robert Johnson had left this in his will, that he was going to give his stamp collection to KWI Foundation my sister Kate said they didn't have a clue what to do with it. They had no idea what what do you do with the stamp collection? And I said, oh, give it to me because I will appraise it and I will give the value of what you get to KWI.
Here's some examples. Here's from that collection. If I can show you some pictures. Indian stamps tend to be pretty boring kind of things, but for those of us who are into it, you can have fun with it. But it's really hard to dress up Queen Elizabeth or Queen Victoria in profile because she really wasn't all that great at photo. But I spent two and a half months going through that collection. It was just glorious. And if I could make better pictures, I can show you. I have now mounted one. And in my own collection now, I have a couple beauties. And in fact, that, that collection did have a few very early Indian stamps. And if I recall, here is one of them. You can see right there. I got that from the Robert Foundation. So I had to look through about 200 pages of stamps and a couple, about a thousand or so of them, but I found one or two pretty good ones that was worth every bit of it. See what Woodstock taught me? Persevere and stick with it. Something about palms or psalms or something for those who persist, but I persisted and I'm having a lot of fun doing those stamp collections. So I've actually made the, I've made the comment to KWI, if there's anybody else who wants to get rid of a stamp collection, I'll happily look through it and I'll share it with anybody else. If there's any other crazy stamp collectors out there, this is a pretty arcane uh, hobby. But, you know, Woodstock got you on your passion and got you going on something that you might not have ever done otherwise. Thank you, Woodstock. I'm Paul Friesen, 97.6 years old. I was at Woodstock from 1933 through 1940. I understand you're having a reunion this summer. It would be nice to be there, but there's no possibility under the present conditions. The cement floors of the hostel, the boys' hostel, were uh, trowelled very smooth, in fact slick, developing a glossy sheen. After dinner one evening, before lights out, someone got the bright idea of waxing the floor with three cherries, shoe polish, and life boy soap. It didn't take much of a run to slide all the way across the room, seeing the little fiber rugs beside each bed as chariots for a rider to be pulled on by two boys barefoot. They went round and round pulling each other. It was fun. The master on duty that evening was Robert Fleming. In all fairness, it should be said, he has come to be regarded as Woodstock's patron saint, but in my day, he was something else, a sneak with crepe sole shoes. When he appeared at the door, we boys all sang out, read us a story. Naturally, he was prepared. So he set out to sit on top of one of the large chest of drawers. And with a hop, skip, and a oops, he landed on his butt on the polished floor. Indeed, it was a, a, an experience uncalled for. He assured, be assured, hell hath no fury like that of a schoolmaster disgraced. All boys were ordered out of bed to wash the floor with their towels. It was midnight before the light got turned out. Hi, my name is Rav Sethi, class of 2009 Tenacious. Uh, I'd like to thank Vosa for organizing this online reunion. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about myself, uh, I have a studio that I started here in Ahmedabad called the Compass Box Studio. Uh, and I have to thank Woodstock for fueling my passion and helping me discover music. 
and uh, we have been recognized as being one of the top 10 studios in the country for Indian musicians. We produce these one take live recordings that have kind of gotten us famous on the indie scene in India. Uh, to show you a little glimpse of it, I partnered up with fellow Woodstocker, uh, Nisa Shetty, who is class of 2010. And we did a one take live performance of one of her songs called Leave This City, which I produced at the studio. I hope you guys liked it. You don't always have to be so strong You don't always have to be so right When everyone else seems so wrong You're spending all your time running around In a city that's turning you upside down And you have no one to hold But now you want to run away Taken what you had to give me There's no other way to say goodbye than walking away hey. And I'm just gonna say this one time This is going to be the last time You see me this way was holding in But time I'd have changed Yeah, yeah, yeah an awesome live recording session of one of my originals called Leave the City uh, with these wonderful musicians <laughs> who have given us this lovely space which everyone needs to come and check out. Yeah, uh, so we did this rearrangement for her track and it was really awesome. Click below, like, subscribe to the channel so you can stay up to date. Hello, my name is Sanjeev and I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Woodstock School. 
and I'm here today to give you a quick tour of some of the building projects that we have undertaken over the past 12 months or so. We'll start off with our iconic quad and I'll show you around. We will start our tour in the quad and go up the stairs by the music building. We're now on the west side corridor. You can notice the wood paneling and the brand new quota stone flooring that's been put in. We pass by the fire hydrant system that's a standard across all of our recent renovations. This is one of the classrooms that's been renovated. Again, you can notice the wood paneling of the ceiling, the interactive whiteboard, the projector, and the brand new carpets. All classrooms that we'll walk through in this tour are climate controlled. This is a new connection at the back of the building that's been created, allowing us to get the classrooms to the east side, which gets the most light and push all the corridors to the, to the opposite end. To reduce clutter, we have carved out a separate space for these well-designed lockers. We are in front of the biggest classroom on this floor, which is dedicated to our outstanding partnership with Friends of Woodstock School, without the support of which none of this work would ever be possible. All these beautiful doors and windows have been made from high grain teak wood, handcrafted locally. All the classrooms follow a standardized template for us to be able to maintain and use them well. This is the front corridor that looks into the quad. Uh, what's not visible in this video is the massive steel structure that was put around the building to, to provide it the strength that it needs. This is how we are ensuring that these heritage buildings stay intact for a few more generations or more without any intervention at all. We we'll pass by a classroom that's been renovated through the generosity of the class of 1981 with a matching donation from FWS. This is currently with the music department. Every detail in this renovation has been worked out through a very close partnership with a world-renowned heritage architect working directly with faculty who would be using these classrooms. We've had feedback sessions with students and received very valuable input, all of which has been taken into account into the planning. These spaces are equipped with ultra-modern technology. Even the clocks in every classroom that you see are actually centrally synchronized by a master clock that transmits identical time to a network of clocks. Here's another view of the quad. We've redone the drainage and the flooring on one side of the quad to protect the foundation of this old and heritage structure. We'll now walk towards the south side of this building. As we peep in, you can notice that we've actually extended the slab by another seven feet, carving out some very valuable communal space by a newly created coffee shop which you can notice on the left. This is one of the most popular destinations for Woodstock students and even staff right now. This is the highlight of the work that we have done. One of, again, one of the most popular spaces in the quad building. Um, this is actually a student and staff working space with 160 square feet skylight over it. The skylight of, is made of toughened glass to protect it from monkeys and hail. It's a, multifunctional printer which is now standard across our offices and a small pantry for serving snacks to to kids we now head back into the corridor and get a view of another classroom on the north side of the building again following a very standard well-defined template We are walking into a, an acoustically treated recording studio that we have created for students to record their language assignments. Um, that, that, that's a requirement in IB. You can notice the acoustically treated ceilings, the soundproof panelings on the wall. That's another classroom. You can see the amount of natural light that we are able to now get into these classrooms. The classroom line, lighting is actually sensor controlled and it turns on only when we have occupants in these spaces. Um, they've been installed in a way not to interfere with the whiteboard so that students are able to see things written on the whiteboard clearly. 
I really hope this video helps to get you a sense of the work that's been going on at Woodstock as part of our campus master plan. I would like to join the community in thanking you for your constant support and encouragement. It actually makes a huge difference and means a lot to this community. From the mountain top, where the clouds are beneath my feet, where my heart starts to sing this tune, I know it's the land or sky, where the stars are spread across the flow. Where you smell the smoke from the burning wood There's only one place this could be It's the land or a sky You may never know Just what I'm talking about found a home up here There's no way you'll ever go Where you find the mules on the sides of the road where the deer plays on the mountain slope There's only one place this could be It's a land or a sky You may never know Just what I'm talking about Found a home up here. There's no way you'll ever go. You may never know just what I'm talking about. If you found a home up here. This brings to a close our second pre-recorded session of the FWS WOSA virtual reunion. Thanks for joining us and thanks to all the presenters. Immediately after this, the live sessions begin. You can join by following these links. Every hand